All right, today's reading is from James 4, 17 and 5, 8. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is a sin for them. You too, be patient and stand firm because the Lord is coming near. Amen. Let the word of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. A faith that does not need to hold. A faith that does not need to hold. This is the first part. And the second part with the same readings, but we have to read through from James 4 17 through 5 verse 3 through chapter 5 verse 3 so hopefully Donna will read it again uh, next Sunday yeah um, but also uh, just to remind you next Sunday I'll be talking a uh, very important issue about our finance, how to save, and, and how to spend on next Sunday. Same readings, but it's the first part, and next Sunday is the second part. A faith that does not need to hold. Holding In the dictionary definition, the excessive or extreme accumulation of anything, particularly money or possession. The excessive or extreme accumulation of anything, particularly money or possession. this way. A way that you can think now your life. What you have left and what you have used or what are you looking for like security. But remember that God does not oppose wealth, he opposed greed. Think about that. He never opposed about wealth. But if we are greedy, he concerned about it. In Proverbs 10, verse 22 says this, when the Lord places you with rich you have nothing to regret. When, when you are walking with God and God be with you and He bless you with riches, you have nothing to regret. You are not regret for what God has been blessed you. Because He's being with you and you have a fully trust in Him to be with you. But in James chapter 5 verse 3 says this, You have hoarded and piled up wealth in these last days. And sometimes, we are thinking what we're going to take us to the last days of our lives. Knowing for fact, like James says today, remember my brothers and sisters that when you know good things you ought to do, but you don't do it, then you sin. And James was talking to the Christians 
in Jerusalem at that time. At the time the persecution of the Christians and they scattered around the Roman empires hide from them. It was a crisis. It was a difficult time. And he wrote this letter to the believers in Jerusalem by telling them, when you know the good things you ought to do, but you don't do, then you sin. God does not oppose wealth, he opposed greed. And money is a tool to be used. You have a toolbox for the men. This is one of the tools you can put in a toolbox. Money is a tool to be used, not a thing, not anything to be hoarded. So, money, you can use that. It's a tool for you to use it. But not the things to be hoarded. And he kept it all the time. Why do people keep hoarding more wealth? Why? It may be out of fear for their security. Scarcity mentality that we have in our lives. But let me remind you, and I said it so many times in Hebrew 13, verse 5, says this Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with whatever you have because God has said, I will never leave you. I will never abandon you. And that is very important to all of us. Have you ever heard people just say money is the root of all evil? That's not true. That's not true. That was not in the Bible. Because they left the first half of that verse and fill it up by their own. And many people say that, even the preachers, they say that. Here it is, I want to give you right what is the Bible saying. Keep your lives free from the love of money. There's nothing wrong with money. When you love the money more than God, that's what the trouble. Yes. Amen. Amen. And don't believe anybody that say money is the root of all evil. That's not true. It's not in the Bible. And I hope the Christian will know that. When you go with the others, when you end that, they say, hey, sorry, that is wrong. When we love the money, that is the root of all evil. Money is okay. I'm saying to you, money is a tool to be used. There's nothing wrong. You have the right tool with you when you need something to fix. You know how to get it and how to fix it. Money is the tool. It's not an evil. If that true, that money is the root of all evil, no one over here working for the evil. I'm not going to work. I don't want to bring evil to my home or to my lives. But when you love the money, you ignore everything, that's the problem. And what does I say? I think if money have a mouth, excuse me, he might be saying, no, 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 I'm not an evil. When you love me, that's the evil. Out of pride for their status. 
You know, in here in Psalms 92 or 62 verse 10 says this, if your riches increase, don't be proud. Don't be proud. There's a competition who is going to be the richer. And every time they are proud of it, the Bible says, if your riches increase, don't be proud. Don't be proud. You know, I, I love Forbes magazine. And here's one thing that I look at that. The Forbes magazine, sometimes they list the 400 richest people in America, mostly richest people in America. And they list all the name over there, they are proud of it, they compete with each others and keep on, keep on piling, hoarding, hoarding money and money, everything. Only one person didn't use all of the money. Don't be proud of that. At the same time, I love this when I say I like folks. Not all the time, but this is what I love. They also list the 400 people generously giving. Generously. All the millionaires stand around and they keep because they need to be on that board. And I saw on television they interviewing Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, Michael Brubeck. You know what they say? We are working hard. And we will spend everything that we have. One question asks, what about your children? They are okay. But whatever we have, we start giving now. I hope one day Bill Gates part in the front. I'm coming to fix the front lawn of your chairs. And all of a sudden they turn from being proud of to something to share with others. But I want to lead you to very important things for what I would like to say today. The three biblical reason, three biblical reason for saving. Number one, you save to practice self-control. It is a spiritual discipline I say to practice self-control. Whatever you discipline yourself to live on less than you make, you don't spend everything you make. You live on less than you make in, in order to die in order to save. I say that because it's important for Christianity. You are practicing self-control. You are strengthening your character. You are building wisdom. Saving is a discipline against self-indulgence. At one time, at one time, John D. Rockefeller was the richest man in the world and he was often asked, what is the key to your wealth? He said, A.D. 1010, A.D. 1010 principle. What is that? He said, I died. The first 10%, I save second 10%, and I live on the rest. I live on the 80%. 80%. Wow. And he said, 
By doing that, I'm turning things around. Proverbs 21 verse 20, 20 says this in Living Bible, the wise man save for the future, but the foolish man spends whatever he gets. So the first reason a Christian say is because of a spiritual discipline of learning how to live on less than I make. I learn to not be self-indulgent. Okay? The second reason for saving in the Bible is this. To get the money working for me. Get the money working for me. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, either you work for your money or your money works for you. So what is true of you? Do you work for your money or do you make your money work for you? See, any money that you save and then invest it is making money more for you while you are sleeping. That is a good thing. That is a discipline yourself to make your money work for you. And you have to do that through saving and investing. Ecclesiastes 11.1 1 says this, invest what you have because after a while you'll get a return. You'll get a return. I mentioned so many times the parable of the talent where Jesus praised two men in Matthew 25 who invested the money they were entrusted with and they doubled their money and he commanded them saying, you are good and faithful servants. So why do we save? We save because it is a spiritual discipline, show self-control. We save because we want the money to work for us rather than us work for money. Number three. And the third biblical reason is to be able to give to others. To be able to give to others. If I have not learned how to live on less than I make so, I can set aside of my earning and for saving. And if I'm living from paycheck to paycheck, I'm spending everything. I get as soon as I get. There's no way that I can give. <coughs> Let's see if it's in 428. If you have been stealing from others, stop it. Make an honest living work hard. So that here is so that. Here it is. You will have something to give to people in need. Okay? I am going to give to people in need if you save in order to share it with others. That's what we can do. Remember, James spoke to the people of their crisis. He encouraged them to help each other. In Corinthians, Second Corinthians, chapter eight, verse fourteen, will be three. I say this right now: you have plenty, and you can help others that at some other time they can share with you when you need it. In this way, everyone's need will be met. 
we know that in America, there is a vast between the wealthiest or the richest people and the poor people. In the middle, it's not very much of that. If we, if all the richest people in America drop down what they have to govern that can everybody will meet their needs. When we have crisis, everything going to be expensive. When we are riches or good economy, everything will be trouble. It won't make sense. But it's important for us to look at this. That is why James says, that he said this in the best, we started with James 5, 2 and 3, he says, your wealth is rotting. How does wealth not? Because it is food, your mouth will eat your fine clothes, and your gold and silver will be worthless. He says, stop piling food, eventually spoil and decays. Growth, glow, get old and moth eaten. And the value of your precious metal frustrate, so you cannot depend on that. Because at the time of change, it was three things. You become rich. You have a lot of food in your house. And you have a lot of dress to wear. And you have silver and gold. But in here, don't depend on that. Don't depend on that. Every time I stop by in Vegas in my travel, I sit down and have something to eat over there, especially the buffet. I saw all the food I ate and saw all the food. Mostly people, they didn't know what that. They all dumped in the trash. I have time to be walking outside and see all the truck reversing to the restaurant and they dump all the food over there. And I'm thinking about our brothers and our sisters. They did not afford anything to eat. I want to come to the final place. Do you know Jesus Christ? If you don't, I want to introduce you to him. It's just a minute because this is the key to stability and the key to security in your life. I am going to close with a couple of verses from Proverbs 11, 7. It says this, When a wicked person dies, his hope dies too. I heard about a lady who when she died, she was a very wealthy woman and somebody said that she had taken her life and they said she had so to live for. And they said, no, no. She had much to live on. She had nothing to live for. Alright? Nothing to live for. So do you have somebody to live for? Do you have a security that is outlast your own life? That relationship to Christ is very important. 
to all of us. My brothers and sisters, you have all the tools that you need to be with you. But remember, remember that He never leave you, never abandon you. That the God who promised, trust Him. You lost everything in your life, but God lost Jesus in your life. You have everything in your life, I want you to know, take Jesus is the number one of everything that you have. And if you treat Jesus as the number one in your life, you will have what you ask. Because there's everything in this world God created as a tool for you to use. Amen? Amen. Brothers and sisters, I hope you come back next Sunday for the second part. That we continuously talk about the spiritual Savior and how to invest our life. But remember, when they invest in Jesus, He never withdraw here. But when He return back to Him, He withdraw all the grace and the love and the grace and eternal life that you are willing to have. Let us pray. Loving God, we are so thankful for this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to share your word. Help us to say what is right and believe what is right. Don't ignore what is right. Jesus, I ask for your blessing upon all the people who are here and the rest of your church that are here with us this morning. Make them to believe in you and trust in you in what God promises. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.